Welcome to What is a Worker Self-Directed Nonprofit, brought to you by the Sustainable Economies Law Center. I'm Janelle Orsi, the co-founder of the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and I'm here with my wonderful co-worker, Chris Tittle, who's our Director of Organizational Resilience. The audio at the beginning of this webinar is not really good, but turn your volume up and stick with it. It's going to be a great webinar. Okay, we're going to dive right in with a definition of worker self-directed nonprofits. Here we go. Uh, one of the biggest questions that we wanted to answer uh, is what does worker self-directed nonprofit mean? And I looked up some phrases on the internet. I looked up worker self-directed enterprise, which is a phrase I think Richard, Richard Wolf uses a lot and it's actually been around for a long time. I kind of like my own definition um, because there, there's a couple things that it emphasizes. Um, one is that it's not just a nonprofit where some of the workers are involved in governance because actually in most nonprofits there are workers, especially management level workers, who who have a lot of power and influence in governance. But it's the idea of having an organization where all workers have power, and not only do they have power to influence the organization as a whole, but they also have power uh, in the realms, the particular realms and programs where they work, uh, the conditions of their workplace, and actually over their own career and the work they do and the learning that they do. So it's power at a lot of different levels of their work. Um, and then the other thing is that the organization's overall goals and strategies and activities emerge primarily from the observations and the insights and the proposals and decisions of the workers. So they're not coming as much from, say, a board of directors. So one of the most important things I want to say uh, is that it doesn't mean that you have an organization where every worker is involved in every decision. And that's a, a big myth that we need to dispel. And one of the things that I want to say is part of a worker self-directed nonprofit myself, that one of the most liberating parts of it has been uh, the lack of meetings, the shortness and efficiency of our meetings, and the fact that so much gets done without me actually ever having to weigh in on it. Um, so uh, a little later on, I'm going to talk about the law, uh, the nonprofit corporations law, and how that affects worker self-direction. Uh, and in a minute, my coworker Chris Tittle is actually going to give some details about how worker self-direction works at our organization. So I, I just want to start by saying uh, why we're so enthusiastic about this and why we think it's actually very important because we have so many nonprofits already and there's so many nonprofits being formed every day. It's such a key piece of our economy and a key piece of our, um, our goals of social change that we should actually be thinking very deeply about how we manage nonprofits to make them as effective as possible. So, and I actually do think, I mean, I've finally come around to see that it's possible we've been going about nonprofit governance all wrong for a long time, or or maybe it's just that we've gotten to a point in history where uh, it, it's just not right anymore and we need to do something different. Whatever it might be, uh, I was racking my brain all week about what could be a possible visual metaphor, uh, or I'll get to the visual metaphor in a moment. Well, actually, here's another one. Um, this is actually, I created this graphic just to say that it should have actually been a wake-up call a long time ago given that a lot of people just think of nonprofits as these big clunky organizations that are slow moving and many times ineffective or inefficient. And the fact that people make fun of nonprofits so much probably should have led us to ask questions a long time ago and rethink nonprofit governance. And there's this great blog with much wisdom called working at a nonprofit.tumblr.com uh, with all of these animated GIFs about working at a nonprofit. And the problem with them is that they just feel so true when you look at them. And they're also very funny. So you might enjoy taking a look at that. But again, it should have been a wake-up call. So this is a visual metaphor I came up for nonprofits and how they're governed. So here we have a mountain. And we basically have the, the mission of an organization, uh, which in various forms is somehow creating a better world. And our job as a nonprofit is to basically work toward that mission uh, and sort of wind our way up the mountain. And I want to ask actually four different questions about worker self-directed nonprofits, which is, are they actually more effective at four different really important goals of nonprofit governance? One goal is to advance the mission. Another goal is to be accountable and maintain integrity. And here I have somebody 
kind of pumping resources away from the nonprofit. And actually, a lot of nonprofit law revolves around this question, which is not how do we advance the mission, but how do we just prevent people from uh, stealing money and uh, tapping the resources or exploiting the resources of the nonprofit. So that's a huge question that comes up in nonprofit law. And another goal is to simply be a stable and resilient organization and to weather changes and to weather crises. And um, I, yeah, I think a lot of nonprofits struggle with this. And I, I think there are nonprofits that do well with some of these goals and not so well with others. But I've actually been thinking that worker self-direction might advance all of them. And I probably don't need to explain why. But um, being good to employees is also a really important goal. And it's not the reason that we form nonprofits. We form nonprofits to advance the mission of the nonprofit. But I think a lot of people will agree that the well-being of workers in this society is of paramount importance right now. And really, it's part of the resilience of the organization, the integrity of it, and the efficacy of it. So with that said, let's look at what I would consider to be a more conventional nonprofit. And so here you have the workers of the nonprofit. They're basically building pathways to a better world. And those pathways take the shape of various programs. And, and each program takes you know, different journeys just based on the local conditions that it's encountering. And so you also have a board of directors. And nonprofits are legally required to have boards of directors and to operate under the ultimate direction of the board of directors. So um, what you do end up with, though, is kind of fly-by governance uh, on the part of the board, because boards are often comprised of, of busy people. And they often meet, you know, say, four times a year. And when they do meet and when they do tune into the work of the nonprofit, they have to kind of take in a lot of information, absorb, um, they have to absorb input and give advice on the strategy and the policy of the organization. But in many cases, it's hard because they're not there every day uh, tuned in. But one of the things that boards do because they're not there every day is they hire management. And they hire the CEO, uh, the development staff, perhaps. And they really delegate most of the work, the strategy making, the policy, the day-to-day -day work, uh, to the hands of those managers and CEOs. Uh, and so the board generally communicates with the management, and the management communicates with the workers. But already you can see a problem developing here, which is that you can create a game of telephone, which is that messages from one part of the organization might not fully reach uh, another part of the organization. And you create these rather large feedback loops that can take a long time to navigate. And so if you're a worker on the ground and you've implemented a program, you go forward and you realize, oh, this is actually not working so well. We need to change course. A lot of times, in order to get permission to change course, you have to provide the feedback to the management to, to get permission from the board or gives permission to the management and all the way back down. And by the time you've done all that, um, things might have changed quite a bit. Um, in fact, here's another one of those animated GIFs. It kind of points to that problem. Is that sometimes by the time you've resolved an issue, conditions have completely changed. And, um, so, and for the workers who are navigating very rough terrain sometimes, very diverse communities, very changeable conditions, you know, the board can't just fly by every time it snows or any, every time something different happens. But another issue with um, the hierarchical management in the organization is if you put a lot of the decisions in the hand, hands of management, what you end up with is a bottleneck because every day workers are basically receiving input, uh, receiving feedback, learning lessons from their work, coming up with ideas and proposals. And when they send those to the management, uh, it creates a bottleneck a lot of the time because management just cannot take the time to process and respond to all of this information coming from workers. And for management, it becomes stressful and overwhelming. And you also end up with animated gifts like this one, which is just a sense that even if you have a particular need or if your work is not going to be effective unless you unless something changes, there's a lot of this lack of confidence among nonprofit workers in their organization and their management. And uh, you know, it creates resentment, it creates bad attitudes, it lends, you know, causes people to slack off or become disengaged from their work uh, when they really don't trust that the, the organization is going to help them do their jobs. So 
Uh, and another thing that it causes um, is the demand by managers to have very high compensation. I think that this is one of the causes of these demands um, is that you know the organization ends up relying so much on the management that the management can go to the board and say, you know, if you don't give me a higher salary, I'll leave. And management ends up having a lot of leverage with the board because the board, again, they're busy people. They don't want to have to go out and hire somebody new. And so there's a tendency to up and up the wages of management because management has that leverage. Um, and there's also an effect of that uh, that's kind of self-reinforcing in a way, which is the greater the pay differential is created over time, the greater the distance between management and workers. And it creates um, a tendency by management to need to look busy or act important or come up with so-called innovative ideas whether or not they will actually work on the ground. And um, it also creates resentment. And overall, I think this distance is not a good thing to uh, facilitate effective communication feedback loops. And of course, management is also in a difficult position of constantly having to integrate ideas and suggestions or even mandates coming from the board. And you know, this does happen where the board of directors decides they want to take something in a completely new direction and undermining some of the work that's been done. And it could happen for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's a good reason. Other times, maybe an individual board member just has a personal passion that they want to pursue by using that nonprofit as a platform for it, whatever it might be. Again, it creates a lot of unhappiness and tension in the organization. OK, so sort of clearing the air for a minute and just getting back to the workers. Uh, one question is, is it possible that if only workers were running the organization, could they actually more effectively advance the mission? And you know, I drew this hot air balloon to basically say, you know, just because workers are working on the ground doesn't mean they can't also get that 50,000 foot perspective on their organization and kind of um, look at the big picture and do big picture goal setting and strategy. So there's no reason that workers can't do that. You just need to create a space for that. And in fact, the fact that workers are kind of tethered to the ground, they're both thinking big picture and working on the ground, in many ways means that what they come up with could be far better because the big picture strategy they know is going to work on the ground because they're on the ground. Uh, workers can also just more effectively advance the mission because they're constantly in a much tighter feedback loop. So if they see room for improvement and they can immediately make that improvement, it just allows the organization to advance much more quickly and effectively. And there's still a role for the board because there still has to be a board. And the board might be people who do give good input on the big picture and bring ideas. But if the board decides to create a worker self-directed nonprofit or to empower workers, then really it needs to um, actually let that process take its course and know that intervening many times could undermine uh, the worker self-direction and undermine its efficacy. So dropping suggestions, intervening when they see mission drift as represented by the snow machine and the person skiing down the hill. So this is an example of, okay, the board actually sees the workers starting new projects and programs that are drifting away from the mission. I was trying to come up with a play on words here about a slippery slope, but I could not quite come up with it. But anyway, so the board can intervene in moments like this, for sure. Um, so second question, can workers actually create more accountable organizations that maintain integrity? And it's a little hard to give specific examples here, uh, but I actually think that hierarchy in organizations is a lot of what leads to um, corruption and lack of integrity to begin with because of the distance, because of people getting in positions of power, leveraging for higher salaries, um, controlling parts of the organization's finances. Um, when you have workers who are just on uh, much more equal ground uh, and managing the resources of the organization, they're very accountable to each other. And I think that makes the organization a lot more accountable and responsible. And overall, it's not spending as much money on the high cost of maintaining hierarchies, the high cost of these giant feedback loops and all of the meetings and so on. So I also think worker self-directed nonprofits are more resilient. And I came up with a whole list of reasons why they'll be more stable. But I think one of the major things is workers create it creates a sense of quote unquote ownership among workers. And when workers have a sense of ownership, they really step up, they take a lot more responsibility, 
And this becomes one of the greatest cures for founder syndrome. If everyone is taking responsibility over the organization, if you lose a key staff member, the founder, it's a lot more resilient because the workers who have already taken on a lot more management can step in and do good work. Um, also, the workers are there addressing problems as they arise. If they see a crack forming in the system, they can immediately address it. And again, they don't have to go necessarily always all the way through the giant feedback loop. I also think they're just better places to work and they'll attract more talent, there'll be less turnover over time, which makes them more stable. And again, the board has a role to play here because if they see cracks uh, developing, they see problems developing that are not being addressed, boards really legally have to intervene. So providing constant input to the board is really important and reporting to the board. Okay, finally, worker self-directed nonprofits are just far more capable of knowing what is good for employees? And I mean, I think a lot is changing in this age in particular that I think people are not as motivated by the ability, ability to move up the organizational ladder and make lots of money. People are really motivated by having uh, satisfying work and having a voice that matters in their organization, being able to learn and grow and be creative and build community and have fun. And so worker self-direction uh, is a means to all of these things. So worker self-direction alone can create uh, these conditions uh, because it puts everybody behind a wheel and they can really drive uh, their work in ways that are good for them, good for the world. And of course the board has a, a role to play here, especially to be legally accountable to employees and comply with the law and all of the protections and benefits afforded to workers. So I'm going to pass it over to Chris, but before I do that, I just want to say that worker self-direction can really only work if you have a high level of structure and very clear policies and procedures. And there's a phrase, uh, tyranny of structurelessness, which is what I think can happen when you actually don't adopt structure. What happens is a lot of natural hierarchies begin to form. People who have very loud voices or have a sense of entitlement to speak up, they will speak up and they will start to take control. And so, um, I will just leave that slide and call Chris over. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Tittle with the Sustainable Economies Law Center, taking over the headset here. Hopefully, you can hear me. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, keeping track of some of the questions that are coming in. So it's great to see everyone really engaged in this topic. Uh, and just to note that I'll be spending about maybe 15 minutes talking more the specific details of how we at the Sustainable Economies Law Center I've tried to implement uh, a really worker self-directed organization. And after that, Janelle's going to spend another 10 or 15 minutes uh, diving more into the specific legal considerations that you have to think of. So some of the more nitty-gritty uh, nuts and bolts. And then we'll have some time for some Q&A. And we know that there's a lot of embodied experience and wisdom on this call right now. So we may have a chance to hear from a couple of people or not. So the question, how has Selk done this? And when we, when Janelle and I were, you know, playing with these different metaphors uh, and inventorying all the various policies and practices that we've put into place at Selk over the last three to four years, uh, I realized that actually some of the, the policies themselves and the practices fit into these four different categories of why we should do it as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, four different areas as well: governance, transparency, and accountability internal communication specifically, how we talk to each other uh, in a really dynamic way, and then what are the, the rights and responsibilities of staff to enable a highly functional uh, worker self-directed organization. And to take the mountain metaphor itself in uh, a slightly different way, at Selk we also have a sense that for the organization to function in a really healthy way, uh, it, needs, it needs many different elements and relationships kind of like a mountain ecosystem itself, uh, which requires many different species and relationships to function uh, in an ecological manner. For example, you know, we, a mountain ecosystem needs forest cover to stabilize the soil and feed clouds that bring rain. It needs streams to carry the nutrients and the water throughout the system. It needs pollinators and predators and plants of all kinds. And when any one of these relationships or species are removed, 
it impacts the entire system, right? So in, in the same or similar way, the practices and policies that I'm going to talk about now uh, that we've implemented at Selk, I think, collectively enable us to be a really resilient and empowered organization. And if we were to remove any one of these or a significant number of them, it probably wouldn't work in the same way. So let's start with governance and decision making and meeting processes. Uh, now, this is an organizational chart that uh, we've created at Self to try to sort of demonstrate the, the, the nature of decision making. Um, our model is actually based on an organizational system called Holacracy, which you can, you can read more about online, holacracy.com. But basically, it enables uh, many different semi-autonomous circles to have a high level of decision making authority distributed to them. And as you can see, we have a general strategy circle, which is the sort of source of all power. And that's uh, every staff member at Selk sits on that general strategy circle. And then you'll, you'll notice about 15 other semi-autonomous circles ranging from operations and admin all the way down to legal professions, which are both our outward facing programmatic areas as well as our internal sort of uh, administrative circles. And every staff member is on a handful of these circles, which are empowered to make certain decisions themselves. Other decisions have to be made by the general strategy circle. And what's probably missing from this maybe complex uh, chart is that there's also a fair number of, of volunteers, outside advisors, partner organizations, that are plugged in to this governance model and are actually impacting the, the decisions of certain circles, but not the entire organization. So that's a way of um, dealing with uh, a really distributed governance model and, and highly defined decision-making realm. Another point just to, to make is that we do actually intentionally share the administrative and fundraising responsibilities. Instead of creating a separate class of admin people, we've actually distributed the tasks of grant writing and fundraising and operations throughout the organization because that, that is part of the work. It's an, uh, an essential piece of running an organization. We don't want to create a second class of self staff member whose you know, job is just to deal with all the stuff that the rest of us don't want to do. So we try to infuse the, the admin responsibilities with all the values of doing the work as well. Uh, you know, this may look more familiar to some of you, but um, instead of locating power at one point at the top of this, uh, we've created many centers of power and many centers of decision making. And devolving that decision making to the most appropriate scale which doesn't always mean everyone is making every decision, as you pointed out. It's about uh, refining where decisions get made. And I'll talk a little bit more about our process of coming to that in a second. But more specifically, how do we make decisions? Uh, this might look familiar to, to anyone who has been a part of a, a collaborative or a collective organization before. And the insight that we've come to, and, and many others as well, is that having highly structured meetings is essential. It's not about just sitting around and having, uh, giving everyone the floor to speak to whatever their mind wants to share. But there is a way of structuring meetings so that everyone does have a voice, but in a highly refined and, and uh, effective, efficient way. So we use circle processes in, in most of our meetings which uh, you know, helps to assure that everyone can speak and that they know that it's going to come back to them. So they don't have to uh, take the floor for 10 minutes when it's finally their turn. They know that they're going to have a chance to say whatever they need to say. The other important thing here is that we have different meeting processes for different types of meetings. So every week we have one staff meeting and it alternates between a governance meeting in which we make collective decisions uh, and what we call a tactical meeting, which is more about updating uh, your coworkers about what's happening within each program. 
So different meeting processes that enable different types of information to be communicated. And in fact, I really enjoy our meetings. Uh, we only get to do them once a week as a full staff, and, and they're, they're so effective that I really enjoy them, and I get a lot out of them. And uh, so it's a very different experience than some other collaborative groups I'm a part of where meetings tend to last forever, and I'm never really sure at the end of it what just got accomplished. And I think what enables this to happen, why we make the decisions collectively, is based on what Janelle already spoke to, is that the staff members are the primary sensors of the organization's needs. We, we have some amazing board members, but they're not particularly active on a day-to-day -day basis with our organization, uh, and, and they trust us to make the decisions that need to be made. Um, when we do make decisions, and everyone within the organization can bring a proposal at any given time, whether that's about a, a programmatic area or about an internal policy, we can use a, a highly defined process of uh, proposing the measure and giving everyone a chance to ask clarifying questions and then giving everyone a chance to provide feedback or reactions or responses. The onus is then on the person bringing the proposal to integrate that feedback and to modify the proposal. And because there's this uh, really engaged feedback loop, it allows us to make a lot of decisions even when some people think it's not the best decision. There's no, not pressure to get things perfect because we know that in two weeks there's going to be another governance meeting and decisions can always be revised. An important point on objections. We have a very high threshold for objecting to any proposal, and that's by design. Um, the threshold that we've defined in our organization is that you can object on the grounds that you think a proposal would take the organization backwards in its mission or irreparably harm the organization. So it's not simply a matter of personal preference or strategically I think it's there's a better way. It's simply that if you think this will harm the organization, you may object and the proposal does not move forward. There's of course a process for uh, how to integrate objections and then to bring revised proposals. But in the almost three years I've been a, a member of the Silk staff, I think there's only been one objection. And it happened recently. Uh, and, and I think that's for a lot of reasons, but one of which is because we know that we can revise decisions at any point going forward. Now that said, beware of the tyranny of structurelessness rex. And structurelessness, structurelessness rex is a favorite character of ours, uh, Selk. Uh, and it comes from a phrase that was coined uh, back in the 60s and 70s during the women's liberation movement, which was the tyranny of structurelessness. And this was a time when uh, many organizations were formed explicitly non-hierarchical, completely flat organizations because they were reacting against perceived hierarchies and patriarchies in society, resisting the very, very idea of leaders themselves. However, uh, as some people within that movement later observed, quote, this apparent lack of structure often disguised an informal, unacknowledged, and unaccountable leadership that was all the more pernicious because its very existence was denied. So, our sense of things is that it's not about abolishing structure of all kinds, it's about being really clear about what that structure is and being really specific about such things as uh, procedures for meetings, procedures for adopting, reviewing, uh, objecting to proposals, uh, how do you create an agenda, Fears of decision making, so which decisions need to get made by the whole group, and which can be made by uh, by circles, semi-autonomous circles. Uh, what are the voting rights that members have? What are the procedures for amending some of the policies? All these things can be enumerated in your organizational document. So moving on to uh, some of the rights and responsibilities that staff have at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Now, within the, this sort of holocratic structure or uh, 
Selkocratic structure, as we call it, since we've sort of revised holacracy to, to meet our needs. Each staff person fills many different roles. Rather than each of us having a defined role that we then have complete domain over. In most conventional organizations, people tend to have a fixed job description uh, and a job title that, you know, rarely expresses what they're actually doing. And part of this helps to maintain your accuracy and pay differentials. You know, job titles are a way of, of locating your status within the organization. Uh, so we've kind of flipped that and said, We've actually defined all the roles that need to, to be filled in the organization, and then individual staff people fill those roles. So, for example, if you look at the slide, um, we've defined roles such as recycling and grant writer and cartoonist. And each of these roles actually sits within a defined circle, and then different individuals can fill those at different times. This is probably a good moment to uh, note that Janelle is uh, our cartoonist. So all the, the drawings that you see here are, are done by her. So she fills that role of cartoonist. Uh, but at some point, you know, someone else could fill it. You know, the, another staff member named Eunice, who's an amazing graphic designer who also draws cartoons. And so at some point, she might fulfill that role for a certain time. And I think this is, this is really liberating to say, I don't have a fixed role. My role in the organization can evolve based on my personal uh, needs and, and expertise as well as uh, the needs of the organization. Next, we, we sort of adopted this culture or ethos of upskilling. This is a phrase I think you heard uh, some folks in New Zealand doing some really dynamic work. Um, what are they called? In spiral. In spiral. Yeah, in spiral group. It's doing some really exciting work around distributed governance. And they talk about the ethos of upskilling, meaning that we support every staff member in becoming more skilled in anything that they're interested in. And this, this allows people to really break out of what they may have been perceived as being experienced in when they were brought on and filling roles that no one would have necessarily thought they could do. Uh, and this is potentially subversive in conventional hierarchies because it, it basically says that any of your coworkers could do the work that you're doing now. Uh, which means that you know you're no longer better than someone else simply because you're doing one one role or one skill. And in fact, we support each other in, in being trained. We have a, a budget specifically for um, professional development and training uh, and things like that. Um, the other way that this is really prominent in our organization, uh, in a legal center, four out of our eight staff uh, are actually becoming attorneys but without going to law school. So only only four of our, excuse me, only three of our staff members are actually attorneys. But we all are, uh, you know, empowered to make decisions on the same footing. So we're actively encouraging uh, some of our staff members, including myself, to train ourselves to become attorneys while participating in the governance of this organization. That's a really exciting thing. And I'm uh, actually going to be studying for a big test next month. So wish me luck. The next thing on the sort of rights of our worker directors is what cumulatively we might call a liberating work schedule. So we've implemented a handful of policies, including a 30 hour work week, highly flexible work hours, and a free time off policy that together uh, have enabled people to be as creative and effective as they possibly can. Now, the free time off policy and the flexible work hours uh, have sort of naturally arisen out of the autonomous and decentralized way we run the organization. So we naturally decided, gravitated towards policies that uh, enabled people to work from home on certain days of the week uh, and together on certain defined days of the week as well. Because we know that everyone sort of works most effectively in different environments, we've tried to create an organizational culture and structure 
that empowers people to find the places where they are most effective and creative while still remaining accountable to each other. And because we have all of these other accountability mechanisms in place, like uh, transparent ways of tracking each other's tasks and vacation time, uh, we know how everyone's doing and we're, we're able to provide that feedback in real time. The culture of trust is an important part of this whole puzzle. Um, you know, and if we're letting people make decisions about the direction of our organization, it sort of makes sense to trust people to be able to get that work done in their own time. The free time off policy is, I think, a really interesting piece that we added, uh, I think, last year. So instead of defining a, a set number of days off, paid vacation days, we leave it up to each staff person to propose uh, as much paid vacation time off as, as they need. And of course, because there are feedback mechanisms in place, we can let people know when we think that they've taken too much time off or too little time off, in fact. And so it, it, it accounts for the different needs that each individual has and different circumstances that come up in people's lives. Now, the 30 will admit is aspirational. Of course, there's a lot of work that needs to get done. But since we're all unique here, needs and interests, we, we really want to support people in bringing their full selves to this work. And that includes giving people space to pursue their other interests. For example, roller skating. Uh, or engaging in direct action and political organizing. Uh, or volunteering at a tenants' rights clinic or urban farming, one, just one to name a few of the things of the that our staff do with the rest of their industrial week. complex, if you will, is that it tends to professionalize social change work, uh, and it does it removes a sort of grassroots element of organizing of social change. And at least to me, having a thirty-hour work week uh, enables me to stay really engaged and more volunteer oriented work, which includes uh, community organizing or sometimes direct action work, more politically sensitive things that wouldn't necessarily fit within the purview of our organization. Um, so I think in this sense, uh, having that shorter work we can is also subversive to the nonprofit, nonprofit industrial complex in certain ways. Okay, let's see if I can move this slide forward. Right, moving on to another important topic, transparency. Now, certainly the traditional function of, or one of the functions of a board of directors is to maintain that accountability to a wider public. So of course we have a board of directors at CELT, but we also have an advisory board uh, of some really cool people. And this is part of an attempt to just sort of create that next layer of accountability people who are working in the community and different program areas who we have a, a deep amount of respect for, who we've invited to provide feedback to us on our work and to be uh, sources of support if we have specific questions. So this is one way that we've built in another layer of accountability um, directly to other organizations, other movements, people from other communities that we are not necessarily directly in touch with ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. We've also found that it's, it's been important to be really transparent about our finances and our budgeting and our use of funds. So uh, earlier this year, we published on our website um, a much longer page, if you go to the website, on how we've budgeted our money, how our organization has grown over time, and um, what our budget needs are. And this is to provide more information both to supporters, individual donors, foundations, just general community members about how we're actually using our money. And it reinforces the uh, sort of sense of accountability that we have as an organization to use our funds in a mindful way. Now, uh, here is another really interesting and potentially sticky question around pay. At Selk, we uh, actually all have uh, equal salary. We're paid the same amount regardless of whether you've been working here for five years and you're an attorney or whether you've just joined and you're doing more communications work. Um, our policies themselves uh, contemplate up to a two to one pay ratio, 
But at this point in our organization, uh, everyone is paid the same. Although there's a lot of other reasons for um, how you might distribute pay within an organization. Um, it may not work for everyone to pay each staff person the same amount. And some of the reasons, some of the factors you might consider include, you know, workload differentials if some people are actually uh, working substantially more uh, per week or have greater responsibilities, you know, that might be a reason to pay someone more. Um, seniority is possibly a basis for doing that because it incentivizes people to stay at the organization. Um, but, you know, just because someone's been there for a long time doesn't mean that uh, other people who have been working elsewhere aren't as important or effective. Uh, so, you know, all of these reasons are, could be problematic for different, re for different reasons. And another uh, factor is need. You know, some people uh, may have children or health needs or educational debt, and there might be a way of considering each person's financial needs and determining how much they get paid. One idea we started playing with uh, in the context of an organization sort of transitioning to, to nonprofit or self-direction is, you know, to create a five-year period over which you might move those pay rates to a more equal footing. But this is one of the big questions, outstanding questions that we'll try to get to at the end. How do you convert to this or what, what does that look like? And lastly, just to wrap this up, our, our internal communication. Uh, how do we stay accountable to each other, particularly when we work in a, in a distributed manner? Um, oops. Yeah, so we, we have a, a variety of communication platforms that we use for different types of conversations. For example, we use email for certain things. We use this task management platform called Asana for transparently keeping track of everyone's roles and projects and deadlines. And we started playing with another platform called Slack for uh, allowing circles to, to communicate in a more real time fashion. And of course, different meeting types for different meeting outcomes. It's important to have you know, a healthy culture of communication as well. So we have a, a handful of processes that are essential to that, including uh, a peer review process where two of your coworkers uh, on a regular basis are providing feedback. Um, some of our staff have, have specifically sought training in restorative justice and anti-oppression. Um, we have a conflict resolution team that can be used when, when conflict does arise. Because conflict will arise. It's, it's a neutral thing, and it's how, how an organization or individuals engage with that conflict that's important. So with that said, obviously there could be way more to say, and I really look forward to talking with folks uh, after this to share more and to hear what, how you all have looked at this. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry for taking that's so okay. long. That's okay. So I just realized that probably the discussion will happen at the hour. So feel free to stay a little bit after the hour and um, we can chat because I think the legal stuff is going to take 10 minutes. So sorry about that. Anyways, the law. Here's what we want to know about the law. Um, it comes mostly from corporations law and tax law with regard to nonprofit organizations. And we should definitely be thinking and worrying about the law if we're going to start tinkering with nonprofit governance, because it could put people in risky positions. You know, directors and officers can get sued, um, could get fined. The organization can get fined. And so it's really good to spend some time learning about this stuff. And so I'm going to hit five legal questions just really quickly, which is how much is a board of directors able to delegate its duties? What, what is the actual mechanism by which it delegates it? Is it in the bylaws or policies? Uh, what kind of oversight does the board have to provide on an ongoing basis? Uh, what are the limits on allowing an organization to be primarily managed by interested persons, people who are getting paid by the organization, i.e. employees? And how do you identify and navigate conflicts of interest, which are likely to come up potentially more in a nonprofit that's self-managed? And so, here are some things you might find in your corporation's code, and I've used California's, but corporation's codes across the country are fairly similar. Um, but one is that a board of directors has to act in the best interest of the organization, so kind of a loyalty to the organization, and it has to act with reasonable care, uh, and to inquire, and to pay attention, and to intervene when necessary. 
uh, to the degree that an ordinarily prudent person would. And so the standard for what is ordinarily prudent really changes over time is ordinary changes. And so right now we're in a time where worker self-governance is increasingly getting attention as a really effective way to run an organization. There's a lot of data potentially showing this. And so an ordinarily prudent person might actually say, worker self-governance is a really good idea for this organization and it wouldn't necessarily be considered an unreasonable thing. In fact, we have a Nobel Prize winning economist, Eleanor Ostrom, who has pointed toward participatory decision-making, uh, group autonomy, self-governance, multiple layers of governance within an organization is actually re really reinforcing its resilience and longevity. And so corporations codes might also say, I mean, they do also say that a board can delegate its management, but it can't delegate it too much because the ultimate control uh, has to be with the board. But what does that mean? What does ultimate control mean? Well, to figure that out, you read a little deeper into the corporation's code, um, and you could also you have to also figure out like, okay, they're they're delegating uh, duties, but they, they also have to provide oversight. And what information do they rely on to make sure that the delegation was proper? Um, and so our corporation's code says that directors are entitled to rely on reports by employees of what the organization is doing in order to assess. Um, how that delegation is playing out. But a lot of times you have to read deeper. You have to go beyond the code into case law. And the case law says very clearly, uh, total abdication of power is not right. If you stop attending meetings, if you stop inquiring and reading the reports, then you're really falling down in your duties as a board member. Um, so this is one of the cases that gets cited a lot, even though it's from the District of Columbia, courts around the country cite it a lot. And also, there's a case in California that brings this up about how much delegation is too much. You know, really, this could be a fun research project for somebody is to collect cases from across the country where courts have decided there was too much delegation of power and to collect cases where the court has decided the, de the delegation was just fine and really try to map out when it's fine and when it's not and what kind of oversight needs to be provided on an ongoing basis. So the court basically said the problem is one of degree. Um, if you just go too far, then uh, then that's a problem, that's delegation. Okay, so how do you delegate? How does your board delegate the power of managing the organization to the workers? It's not actually in your bylaws. A lot of people were sort of assuming, oh, this isn't something in the bylaws, but really the board does need to retain its ultimate control. So your bylaws could look like regular boring old bylaws where the board meets four times a year and makes decisions by vote, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in fact, delegating power within the bylaws could just simply be improper. Um, the board really needs to delegate power based on an ongoing assessment and reassessment of when delegation is proper. So you can delegate through a board resolution. Uh, and this is a resolution that's very similar to uh, the one that our board adopted, which is that if the board is kind of looking at the organization and just saying the staff has a great track, re track record, they have so many skills and talents, there's already a great set of internal policies for worker governance. You know, best practices are pointing toward worker self-management. Therefore, it's actually in the best interest of the organization for us to at least for a while uh, adopt worker self-management and we'll reassess it uh, at reasonable intervals. So we're not delegating and just sort of turning off um, consideration of the issue. We're gonna reconsider it on a regular basis. And in the meantime, provide constant oversight of sort of just watching everything that's going on, reviewing the financials, the activities, uh, and the board really does need to make the decisions about staff compensation, staff benefits, hiring, so that staff doesn't um, uh, make those decisions for themselves because that, that is a conflict of interest. Other things corporations code say, um, actually only a few states say this, but even if they don't say this, there are other rules that kind of hint at this quite a bit, which is that the people in power and the positions of governance need to be non-interested or disinterested, meaning they're not people who are being compensated by the corporation, or that's how California defines it. So you can't have a majority of your board be people who are either being compensated by the corporation as employees or contractors or people who are related to them. Now, how they decide brother, sister, ancestor, brother-in-law, you know, they don't include friend. It's kind of a you know, where to draw the line is interesting. And that's where there's a lot of new 
literature and best practices and proposed standards around where to draw that line. And a lot of it is because of Enron and the feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, we really need to focus on corporate integrity and people in positions of power are exploiting that power and stealing from organizations. So um, the IRS scrutinizes people's bylaws and people's boards to find out like how many people in power uh, are actually people being paid by the organization or have, uh, that are that have transactions with the organization and have said things like you it really depends on the organization and what it's doing but if there are people with close personal relationships actually i think there's a, a martha stewart case where um one of martha stewart's friends you know there's arguably she was an inter interested person just because she was martha stewart's friend uh donor relationships business relationships all of these relationships could play into influencing decisions in ways that undermine the integrity of the organization and so basically there's a lot of standards and laws that focus on creating a disinterested board and this is my big question is are we throwing the baby out with the bath, bath water are we just saying like we have to have board independence i think it's actually possible that if we try to make a board completely uh independent and disinterested they'll truly be disinterested and maybe the people who have the most personal connections personal connections work connections maybe they're donors those are the people who have a very strong interest in the success of the organization they might actually do a better job um, and workers are a very good example of that uh, with an unfinished slide with uh, unfinished notes <laughs> i'm not going to leave that up um, but yeah the question is what if we just shift our focus away from this kind of unrealistic idea that nonprofits should be governed by non-interested persons uh, maybe let's assume that they should be but focus a lot more of our effort on ensuring the integrity and, account and accountability of that organization. And so you do that with really clear conflict of interest policies and procedures, and you really stick to them, you document decisions. Uh, and it's important to point out that the question of who is a disqualified person for the purpose of reviewing transactions under federal tax law includes any person in a position to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of the organization, which arguably you transition to worker self-governance, everybody's in that position. And so that means that anytime you are engaging in a transaction with one of those employees around their pay, benefits, and so on, you really need to have a clear procedure for how that decision is going to be made. Uh, other unfinished slide, oops. Um, anyway, so regular reporting to the board uh, is really important so that decisions that do end up looking like there's a conflict of interest, the board can catch those. And just a handful of other legal considerations that we don't have time to talk about, but um, a lot of nonprofit organizations are actually fiscally sponsored and under the umbrella of larger corporations. And so uh, a question is, how do you set up a fiscal sponsorship arrangement to enable worker self-direction? In some cases, maybe you'll wanna have a class of members uh, or certain board seats that are designated by the workers, although our organization has chosen not to do that. Um, it's interesting to think about how worker self-direction plays out in organizations that are much more member-driven or designed to mutually benefit members, um, like trade associations or cooperatives. You know, how how do you create that balance between the interests of members and the work of the workers? Um, I actually think it could be very effective as well, but um, it's a slightly different uh, take on the whole issue. Um, note that there's other things that can come up. Uh, People's classification for the purpose of an overtime laws can change. Someone who was previously uh, exempt from overtime could become non-exempt because of the potential of their roles to shift around. Uh, it could also potentially undermine union participation. And I realize this a lot of times, you know, your union membership relies on you not being a manager. And if you become a manager, uh, it shakes up the whole hierarchy um, that the whole union membership was built around to begin with. Um, yeah, certain professionals like lawyers also need to exercise independent professional judgment so that kind of uh, interrupts complete worker self-management uh, when professionals are involved. And also, final thought, maybe we need to create a new type of entity for worker self-directed nonprofits so it doesn't feel like we're kind of like pushing and pulling within the existing laws to figure out how much delegation is too much. If we actually create a system, a uh, type of corporation that specifies how to do it, it might be easier and a special category of tax exemption for it, maybe. Anyways, um, 
there is so much to say about this topic. We could write a book about it. And I just thought I'd mention that because there's actually a possibility that we're going to try to write a book about it, just given all of the interest. And we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts or interest about um, maybe contributing to that. But I think we're going to open it up for questions now. And um, these are just a couple questions, but there's it's really wide open. Let me see. This is the largest self-directed organization we know about. If anybody knows of a large worker self-directed organization, uh, please type it into that question box. I think we can read the answer. I actually wanted to throw this book up on the screen because Oh my gosh, this is just such a good book. Everybody should read it. Go to reinventingorganizations.org. And the author profiles, I don't know, about 16 or so large, mostly for-profit businesses around the world that have adopted worker self-management. And oh, it's just an incredible book. And when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh my gosh, so much of what these businesses are doing, are it's the same as what the Sustainable Economies Law Center has done. And so it really points to the fact that there is a set of policies and practices that work together coherently to create effective self-management. But the thing I want to say also is some of the businesses profiled in this book are gigantic, like thousands, thousands of workers. Um, so, yeah, it's great. Um, question about how foundations are responding. Um, how foundations have responded and funded. Well, you know, it's funny. We haven't actually talked about worker self-directed nonprofits. This is a, you know, it's almost a phrase that you just never hear. And I think that's why there's so many people signed up for this webinar is people were like, wow, you know, that sounds like something we've been thinking about in the back of our minds forever, but haven't really been talking about it. And so all that is to say, um, I don't think foundations are talking about it. And there actually might be um, a lot of work ahead of us to educate foundations about what it means, uh, in order to get to get buy-in, but I think overall, when foundations begin to understand worker self-management, uh, they're going to see that in many ways it's a better use of their funds, more efficient use of their funds, and more effective way to change the world. Uh, but again, yeah, that's why we need to you know really keep the conversation going. Some questions about the role of the executive director and that it exists. What function? I'm going to answer the executive director executive director question, and then we'll um, we'll hear some actual voices. So, oh yeah, I'm an executive director. I'm also the president of our board, uh, which makes me all sound very very important. But in fact, in many ways, I serve these roles because outsiders expect uh, people to be filling those roles. And um, that we actually had a proposal to make everybody's title at the organization co-director or to make a larger number of people co-directors. But there is just uh, the mainstream expectation that there will be executive directors who sign the big grant applications and that there are presidents who sign the big checks. And um, I also, I serve both roles because I'm kind of like a link between the circle of worker governance and the circle of board governance. And, um, but yeah, these, these positions overall don't have any legal, they don't have very much legal meaning attached to them as far as the responsibilities that come with being a president or a CEO. Uh, it's really just what each organization wants to give to that position. So we had a couple of folks who, uh, quote, raised their hands and wanted to offer a question or an insight. So I can unmute some of you. Um, first person I saw was Donnie McClurkin. Or can you, I think we might be able to hear you if you speak, Donnie. Hi, Chris. Hi, Janelle. Hey. Hello. Hey, thanks for such a wonderful webinar. I have a question and then a quick observation, um, a couple of observations from our organization. So my question is, with the SELC, at what point does someone come into that general voting circle if they're a volunteer, for example? How much participation would they need to be having before you would say, oh, now's the time to allow them into that circle? Go for it. Sorry. Yeah, you know, most of our governance circles don't engage volunteers because most volunteers uh, don't dedicate a really significant portion of time to the program as a whole. Uh, but in our community renewable energy program, the key leader or advisor of that program for a long time was a volunteer, Linda Barrera. And so um, almost everything that happened in that program was, you know, with her leading or bringing proposals. Um, it's actually a question that we have 
uh, just about how to more effectively integrate volunteers um, and when to give people the actual power to make decisions. We do have one circle now that we're creating that's our fellows who are people we're providing mentorship and support to. They are not exactly volunteers. Well, they're sort of volunteers. They're volunteering for each other. And they've been given a budget to develop programming to support uh, their learning as new lawyers. Um, well, I guess all that to, is to say there's a lot to think about and questions to ask, to think about with regard to volunteers. Yeah, and Donnie, if you just had a, a quick thing to share about your organization, um, then we can hear from some other folks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so I guess uh, from our experience at the Post Growth Institute, we have a bunch of co-directors, and I guess it, it makes me think of, of the word worker and in maybe expanding that to include full-time volunteers or part-time volunteers, which are pretty much make up all of the key group in our sociocracy kind of work. And the other thing that we found really valuable is we hold most of our meetings in silence. They're just typed, and we found that that's a very participatory democratic method. In fact, if you type in uh, the power of virtual silence in Post Growth Institute, you'll see an article we have up on Fast Company that explains that process. So I feel like it's a nice complement to some of the things you've been exploring today. Thanks. Let's see, a couple other typed questions. Um, do you know of any universities that are worker self-directed? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I actually attended a, a school in the UK called Schumacher College, a very small uh, postgraduate school, and it was not fully worker self-directed, but there was uh, the professors and the staff had a, a really large degree of autonomy there. And it was a very small school. There's three master's programs with about 10 to 15 people in each of them. So the entire sort of school community, uh, residential community was about 40 to 50 people at any time. And in fact, all of us as students and staff at Schumacher College, um, we cooked meals together, we did gardening, we actually cleaned and maintained the grounds. There was no janitorial or maintenance crew. And every week, uh, the, the staff of the college would get together and make certain decisions. So there was a certain degree of, of autonomy uh, at that college. And it's a really amazing place um, outside of Totnes in southwestern England, if anyone's interested. They, they run a lot of really fascinating uh, short courses and uh, master's programs. There are actually a lot of questions in the question box and I, I'm pretty sure that people can't see each other's questions, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, one of the questions was about Sustainable Economies Law Center and how we're navigating the legal limits. And um, we keep our board very closely informed with what we're doing. In fact, they get every Wednesday while we're having meetings, little tiny email updates about all of the different programs and things we're doing or about the proposals that we're making and adopting in our meetings. And so that is their ability to kind of monitor what is happening. And then we also have four times a year meetings where we just sort of update them on everything that's happening and um, give a financial update and so on. So that is helping them meet their minimum level of oversight. And so far they haven't felt the need to intervene in our processes because they feel that we are being accountable, advancing the mission, uh, building a stable organization and being good to their good to our workers. So overall they haven't intervened. But if they saw us going off in a funny direction, I'm sure they would. Mm -hmm. Jesse also notes that Mondragon University might have some elements of worker self-direction. That's definitely oh, yeah. possible. I'm, I'm not sure. Any other really burning questions out there? I'm sure there's some that we've lost. Um, and again, I think there's so much uh, collective wisdom in this group that unfortunately we're not able to unmute everyone at the moment to have that conversation now, but rest assured this is not the end of the conversation. For us, it's, it's really just the beginning of this. So we're really looking forward to continuing it and whether that's through a Google group or we have some other um, communications platforms in mind that we might invite folks to, particularly around this idea of uh, collectively writing a book about this topic. So if that is something of interest to you, um, definitely let us know either by email or maybe in the Google group.
Yeah, and actually some of you who asked really good questions, um, you want to copy and paste them into the Google group and just put them out there to the whole Google group. That would be fun so we can mm -hmm. not lose some of these great questions that have been asked. Um, I have one final thing to say before we sign off. Yeah, please do. We're a nonprofit organization. We're worker self-directed, which means the workers are also raising the money for this organization. And right now, we are trying to meet our twenty-five thousand dollar goal, which you can see right here. We have a little, we have a little ways to go. It's up to about ten k now. This Woo! is from last week, Happy so Monday. we're on the way. Yeah, but Tuesday. all of your support is uh, incredibly valuable, even in a small amount. Um, as many of you probably know, working for nonprofits. Yeah, and and we're also encouraging people to become members by giving <clears throat> by giving every month. And when you're a member, we're gonna really keep you in the loop about fun events. And we have a fun in the Bay Area event on Thursday just to celebrate our members. And um, in any case, we would love to keep you in the loop in the community and to have your support so we can keep putting on webinars like this one. All right. That's right. So you should be getting an email uh, in the next couple of hours with some follow-up links, and we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Talk Bye. to you in the cyberspace.